professor Volpe che purtroppo per un impegno istituzionale concomitante non può partecipare questo pomeriggio e faccio gli onori di casa con grande piacere a questo seminario del professor Huerta che è il secondo seminario di questa serie sicurezza e conservazione eh, che proseguirà il 15 poi con un seminario del professor Angelillo. Ora, prima di passare al professor Angelino la parola, eh, volevo dirvi che la locandina del seminario potrebbe far pensare a una visione passatista e un'immagine tratta da una tesi, dalla tesi di Paul Abram, che è degli anni 30, ma in realtà eh, ritengo che le, il modo di vedere, di analizzare, di studiare le costruzioni in muratura che verrà proposto va considerato fortemente innovativo. Noi tuttora, potrà sembrare strano per i non addetti ai lavori, ma purtroppo è così, non abbiamo ancora, soprattutto a livello eh, insomma, di chi poi pratica la professione, non siamo riusciti a diffondere eh, approcci corretti nell'analisi delle costruzioni in muratura, soprattutto di quelle storiche, con il risultato che la velocità di intervento, di processo che caratterizza i nostri tempi ci sta portando verso eh, scenari molto pericolosi in cui si interviene in maniera indiscriminata magari danneggiando irreversibilmente costruzioni che possono avere secoli se non addirittura millenni di storia e allora mi viene in mente una frase con cui uno dei nostri maestri il professore Edoardo Benvenuto chiudeva Uh, il suo famoso saggio la scienza delle costruzioni e il suo sviluppo storico l'ultimo capitolo si intitolava che sia tutta una questione di linguaggio e secondo me è così cioè eh, il problema è acquisire il giusto linguaggio per leggere le costruzioni in muratura e poi se mi permettete eh, di usare questo tipo di espressioni per parlare le costruzioni in muratura cioè per intervenire nella maniera ad essere più consona. Eh, do la parola al professor Angelillo che nel nostro settore scientifico, quello di scienza delle costruzioni, è certamente la persona che in Italia sta compiendo i maggiori sforzi per questo diciamo, eh, eh, salto in avanti dal punto di vista strutturale che porti a una come dire, più corretta e sensata Uh, un più corretto e sensato approccio all'analisi strutturale delle costruzioni storiche in muratura. Scusate un attimo, avevo un problema con l'audio. Allora, intanto saluto tutti, saluto Santiago, vedo il professore Carbonara, che vedo con molto piacere. Ciao Giovanni. E, diciamo che l'introduzione del professor Uberta è un compito molto bello, perché eh, io lo conosco da alcuni anni, abbiamo condiviso alcune cose, mi ha insegnato molte cose, in realtà io ho... Oh, arrivo a questo uh, uh, tema delle murature da un uh, punto di vista molto matematico e ingegneristico che poi si è tradotto invece in un aspetto più uh, concreto, diciamo, e questo lo devo molto a, a Santiago che mi ha insegnato molte cose. Ehm, come dirò solo poche parole, diciamo che la conservazione e la sicurezza del patrimonio storico per vari motivi eh, questi due obiettivi sono diventati apparentemente in opposizione e questo dualismo deriva da precise motivazioni eh, prima di tutto il fatto che nelle nostre scuole eh, questo tipo di eh, materie viene insegnato un po' solo marginalmente soprattutto agli ingegneri e agli architetti che si occupano di strutture eh, l'insegnamento delle tecniche eh, costruttive del comportamento meccanico delle costruzioni in muratura antiche rientra in effetti solo marginalmente nei piani di studio delle nostre scuole di ingegneria e architettura 
eh, non perché l'architetto o l'ingegnere non ricevano una formazione sulla teoria delle strutture moderne, ma il problema è che eh, i metodi eh, relativi al, all'analisi delle strutture in acciaio e calcio e strutture, le strutture moderne, è molto diverso da quello delle costruzioni antiche. E la consapevolezza e, e la competenza in questo ambito richiede un notevole sforzo per avvicinarsi alla filosofia dell'equilibrio eh, dell e delle regole di costruzione della, delle costruzioni. Eh, tale grado di preparazione, essendo praticamente assente nelle moderne scuole di ingegneria e architettura, richiede approfonditi studi specialistici e fornire queste competenze dovrebbe, credo, essere uno dei compiti principali delle nostre scuole di ingegneria civile e architettura. Eh, nella storia e nell'attività del professor Huerta c'è un richiamo forte, un appello nutrito di passione etica e di riflessione culturale a questi temi. La sua vita stessa è dedicata generosamente, interamente a questo e nell'insegnamento ai giovani e meno giovani con il suo stile calmo ma incisivo, eh, ostinato vorrei dire, con metodo socratico il rapporto vero appassionato con i suoi discepoli che vengono da lui da ogni parte del mondo, Santico, eh, Santiago Verta è divenuto, se volete, l'esegeta e eh, il portabandiera di questa battaglia. Per la tutela e la conservazione del nostro patrimonio eh, culturale. Va bene, eh, non, non dico altro, eh, lascio la parola a lui e eh, seguirò con interesse il suo seminario. Prego, professor Huerta, se vuole fare il suo ah, intervento. Sorry. I, I will share my screen. Thank you, uh, Maurizio. Thank you, Aguinaldo. Uh, ok. Well, um, the topic of my lecture is uh, historic masonry architecture. That is the architecture which was built since antiquity, since, well, since the beginning of civilization until, say, the beginning of the 20th century. We want to preserve and to maintain and to protect this patrimony. But it is not possible to maintain what is not known. And it is, uh, it is a sad fact that along the 20th century, the whole tradition of masonry construction collapsed uh, for, for different historical reasons. But now we are in a difficult position to maintain uh, a patrimony that we essentially don't understand. So in my lecture, I will just uh, present an overview of, of this uh, lost tradition. And I will begin with a, a historical review. Uh, this is a, the frontispiece of the first German edition of Vitruvius. And we see here the, the, the men and women building and using only two materials. Uh, masonry that is brick and stone and wood and these two materials dominated uh, architecture until the beginning of the 19th century the the origin of masonry construction coincides with the origin of civilization some maybe 10 to 12,000 years ago um, it is when the the 
the hunters and the collectors um, invented or discovered agriculture and then settled in a fixed place. And then the architecture, the building, uh, was embedded with this uh, necessity of permanence. And uh, buildings began to be made of earth, brick, and stone. First the walls, then uh, some 10,000 10, years ago, uh, an artificial stone was invented, which is the brick in Mesopotamia and Egypt. And they continue to build walls, but the roofs were made still using wood. Wood is an organic material, deteriorates, can get fire. fire. And then this uh, desire for permanence, this necessity for building with masonry leads the men to the invention of the arch. And the arch was invented because the arch is an invention, it does not exist in nature was invented some 6,000 years ago uh, in, in the Near East, we don't know precisely, maybe in Mesopotamia, maybe in Egypt or Asia Minor. And the canonical arch uh, is the Buzwar arch, and then in the middle of the picture you see a, an Etruscan arch. Uh, but uh, the first arches were not so... Uh, I was going to say well made, not well made. There was not so clear a conception. And there were several hypotheses of how could the invention of, of the arch occur. So on the left side, you see that a building with failed arches, maybe uh, the walls collapsed and formed an accidental arch. And maybe the observer arrives to the idea of the, of the arch and this looks uh, improbable. And on the right side, uh, if you put two big stones forming uh, an angle, uh, they stand. If you add one more stone, they stand. And then put, put in more stones, you will arrive to the idea of an arch. Um, indeed, we don't know uh, how, how did this happen. We know that in America, for centuries, uh, they built in masonry without discovering the principle of the arch. Uh, here in this slide is a, a thumb, the, the, the most part of the remains are thumbs which were protected by the earth on top, but no doubt the arch was also used in auxiliary buildings. This is a, a 4,000 years old thumb in, in Mesopotamia. Um, in the entrance we see a more or less bushwar arch. It is not exactly bushwar. In these uh, wonderful drawings that the archaeologists make, you see that the, the stance has not been uh, exactly cut, so you must put uh, small stones to fix the position of the of the bushwar. Um, but we, we, we do understand this. Also, we see that the stones are not exactly equal, but the keystone is much smaller, that means that they, they didn't calculate well, or maybe they didn't care. But on the left, we see the, the barrel vault forming the, the roof of the stone, and this is made of bricks, uh, uh, crude bricks, uh, made with uh, clay, uh, sand, uh, um, mix it with straw or some uh, animal fibers. But the bricks are, we will say maybe from our ignorance uh, badly put because they are not with radial joints but they are following a strange way and it seems that they collapse it to the left well this is a very ancient example of a way of building walls without centering it appears that to build an arch you need first a formwork a centering and then uh, you put all the stones and then you remove the centering. But uh, after, say, 1,000 years building arches, they discovered the way to build arches without centering. Um, the first uh, arch, the first employment of this, uh, of the arch was sm small, small tombs, maybe one meter by two meters. 
and they continue to build these uh, walls for 2,000 years until uh, around the second uh, millennia before Christus, the arches and walls emerged from the earth and they began to form part of architecture. And these are the granaries of the Rasmuseum with a span of around five meters and built with the same technique of, uh, 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 in, in English, called uh, uh, pitched brick walls. This technique uh, exists still today in the north of Africa. These photos are 1940s taken by Hassan Fati. And we, we see here the way they build these walls. Uh, first, you build uh, a wall, and then the, the master masons uh, draw with clay, because the mortar was clay, the form of the arch. Uh, and then they began to, to set the bricks flat with this clay mortar, uh, with a center angle of inclination. And then when the arch is completed, the arch is stable, and then every stable arch is the centering of the next arch. And in this way, they build these uh, uh, wall thumbs and the uh, great balls of the Rasmuseum. And in, in Nubia, uh, they were building these walls in the 1940s. This technique is still used in, in the north of Africa, and it has been uh, also um, uh, employed by certain organizations uh, uh, involved in uh, economic building using traditional methods like Crater in France and others, Auroville in India. At the same time that walls were built, both in Egypt and in Greece, they employed what seems, and it appears in the books on the history of architecture, as another kind of architecture, the so-called trabeated architecture using uh, columns and lintels. Um, indeed, the appearance is completely different. The mode of construction, construction is different, but the structural behavior is the same. These lintels uh, have a proportion so that it is possible to draw an arch inside. And uh, both the Greeks and the Romans discovered this, knew this, and uh, sometimes in auxiliary uh, structures, not in temples, they uh, they decide not to move uh, enormous lintels, but to divide the lintel in pieces and then form a flat arch. The next step, uh, well, for, say, 2,000 years since the Rasmuseum until the beginning of our era, the, the, the typical span of arches were around, the maximum span were around four or five meters, which is very good for the, for example, the gates of the of the walls of a fortified city. And then uh, the second century before Christ, uh, the Romans invented a new material, the Roman concrete, which is made of small stones and hydraulic mortar. And in this way, uh, they could speed uh, the, the construction and they multiply the span by five, again, reaching uh, many times 20, 25 meters. And they try, this is a drawing by Biole Leduc, and, and they, uh, for example, in the Lazio, they use uh, brick arches to uh, relieve the, the, the wooden trusses uh, from the whole weight of the, of the vault. So first, uh, with light centering, were built the brick arches, and then the, uh, the concrete were uh, um, supported by the brick arches would remain embedded in the, in the masonry when finished. With this technique, they uh, built at the beginning of the second century after Christ, the, the Roman Pantheon with a span of 43 meters, which was the record of unreinforced masonry until the 20th century. It is a very subtle and complicated structure. It is not only uh, Roman concrete, it's a mixture of um, uh, bricks, uh, arch bricks, uh, monolithic columns, and at least six different 
uh, types of uh, Roman concrete, uh, the more dense at the in the foundations and the lighter in, in the top of the dome, which is of uh, unreinforced concrete. Three centuries or so later, they built the great vault of the uh, Palace of Tessiphon with 27 meters. And this vault, it is uh, possible to see for the disposition of the bricks, which was uh, was built again without centering, no? uh, forming the arches against a big wall. Now in the actual state, uh, the wall has separated and, and the vault stand. The Byzantines uh, make this technique of uh, building vaults without centering the the uh, the motive. Well, the main technique in in their architecture, and uh, in this way, they could uh, produce such a, a formidable example as Hagia Sophia, Hagia Sophia, with a dome of only 33 meters that is uh, smaller than the pantheon but the dome is maybe at almost 50 meters from the ground and in in the drawing by Auguste Choisy the, the dome has been removed to to show the buttressing system so this is the the price to put a big dome at a big height and also in a highly seismic area one of the preconceptions we have about uh, masonry is that masonry is bad. It is bad for everything, no? But particularly it is very bad apparently for earthquakes. Um, this is of course uh, a contradiction, no? Because in Turkey they have been building with uh, masonry uh, for thousands of years, at least 1000 of years and and uh, it is uh, nonsensical to think that they were using uh, on purpose a um, uh, bad material. No? Um, this is a picture of a, a great earthquake in 1999. And I used to use this picture just to show the difference between the modern constructions, which are good, and the bad constructions like this uh, little mosque, Ottoman mosque. And the modern constructions are on the floor or in ruin. and the, uh, small mosque has survived. You know? That the masonry is not bad for earthquakes is demonstrated by uh, the mere survival of the buildings. Then we can take another big step and we arrive to Gothic. The Gothic uh, based uh, the construction and the use of the cross vault. The cross vault was not invented by the Gothic. Uh, there was uh, there were uh, cross vaults in Romanesque uh, churches, but the, the Gothic masters uh, understood perfectly the advantages of this uh, system. First, this, the cross vault solve a geometrical problem. If you intersect two cylinders, which has not the same span, the intersection is a very difficult curve. It is not even a plain curve. So uh, they decided to uh, invert the problem, to decide the intersection, that is to build the cross arches, to build the perimetral arches, the transverse and formerets, and then the vault is what is left between these uh, ribs or arches. In this way, uh, they could produce many different forms and adapt to, to very different problems. Uh, the Gothic also were well aware that the, in the cross vault, the, the thrust of the wall were concentrated on the corners of the base and, and in this way they could eliminate the, the, the masonry between the buttress and make the big windows. Mm. So the, the, the Gothic ribs have many functions. First, it solves a geometrical problem uh, and second, it serves as centering of the, of the ribs. Then it hides the difficult uh, intersections of the webs of the masonry of the masonry and, and, and in the last time they produce an aesthetical effect from the inside. The evolution of Gothic, uh, the, the system of ribs complicated and in the last uh, period of Gothic sometimes the, the ribs were faked. They were sometimes 
uh, fake it with uh, plaster or even wood and then paint it as if they were made of stone. In any case, it is impressive, don't the master uh, the mystery of the of these Gothic masons. This has, in the picture are uh, a section and a view of the core of uh, the cathedral in Beauvais in France, 48 meters high, height from the keystone to the floor. That is the equivalent a uh, uh, 15 story modern block. And it was built uh, from the foundations to the top. Uh, and the whole design uh, shows a mastery and a, and a security for the part of the of, of the of, of the these Gothic masons that this is really astonishingly. Um, today we, we we have a sense of fear no? when we contemplate these buildings, and this is another problem in intervention that uh, when an engineer or an architect is asked well how is this building um, well we, we tend to say that the building is in, in danger of collapse well Beauvais has stood for more than seven centuries and it is evidently not in danger of collapse in renaissance uh, the focus concentrate on dome the first renaissance dome not the first, but the most important is that of Runeleski, which was uh, built in 20 years uh, without centering, thanks to a very complicated system that uh, Runeleski invented. And on the right is uh, St. Peter's in Rome, uh, designed by Michelangelo and close by the La Porta and San Gallo uh, uh, 100 years after the dome. Both domes wait around 30,000 tons. The dome in St. Peter's was built in only two years uh, with centering and that means that they put in the work some 50 tons every day. No? That means that it's not only of a problem of stability but of organization of work etc. St. Paul's in in England, the first dome in England, designed by Christopher Wren, has also 33 meters, and it is a highly original and complicated structure with three domes. Uh, the inner dome, which uh, conforms the inner space, and the external dome, very high, with a very big lantern to uh, produce an effect in the city. And in between, a conical dome, supporting the heavy lantern and uh, directing uh, the, the, the weight of the lantern and of the external dome to the inclined walls of the, of the, of the tambour. One characteristic of the structures we have seen is that they have very different sizes. For example, uh, the, the dome of St. Paul's can be drawn inside the dome of St. Peter's. And uh, on, the, on the right side, we see the section of the Cathedral of Ulm, which is a great Gothic cathedral. It looks like a model inside, again, the dome of St. Peter's. This is a drawing of the Capella Pazzi by Brunelleschi. And we see in the drawing that, even in, not a small, but uh, well, conventional building, we can detect maybe a dozen of different masonries. There are monolithic columns, relieving arches of brick, uh, normal arch bricks, uh, domes, uh, star domes, um, there are uh, iron elements. So it is anything but something homogeneous. So masonry is a composite material. It is made of stone, bricks, and mortar, but also different masonries are always present in different, in different parts of the building. And finally, to, to, to close this, uh, this historical review, we have towers. No? We don't know why, uh, since the beginning of civilization, the, the man has the obsession of build high towers. Uh, the, in the Bible is the history of the Babel Tower. Uh, in 
the Gothic, when they finished the core of the, of the, of the cathedrals, they began to build uh, high towers and spires. On the left is the, uh, the first uh, treasury spire, that of Freiburg in Breslau, with a height of 114 meters. And what is amazing is that the, from the level of the the base level of the windows, it is uh, hollow. No? It is a delicate shell of masonry in equilibrium for almost uh, seven centuries, which has supports winds, storms, uh, light bolts, lightning bolts, etc. And on the right is the Asinelli Tower, 100 meters in Bologna, which is inclined. So it's uh, a leaning of some around almost two degrees, and it has survived again for several centuries. So um, this material masonry is so old, so despise it and distrusted today. Uh, the, the history, which is our laboratory in this case, has uh, uh, proof that this is a uh, a reliable, robust, and safe uh, building material, and that these uh, vaulted buildings uh, have uh, a very safe uh, structure. Um, of course, uh, for a medieval builder or for a Roman architect, there will be no, no need to explain this. Um, but uh, for us, who has lost this tradition, we feel the necessity to justify that these buildings are standing at all. On the left, we see a drawing by Biolele Duke, and we see uh, the section of the, of the walls in particular, which is uh, uh, and on, on the right, there is uh, the typical uh, medieval wall, and we see that the walls are not just made of uh, regular block uh, stone blocks that there are three parts no? there are on the outer side uh, a paramount made of uh, more or less uh, well cut uh, stones and maybe with a thickness of 20 or 25 centimeters and the stones are only well cut uh, on the outside no because in the inside they have not uh, they are not well uh, square this stone is a well a good stone it has to resist uh, the, the weathering and the water maybe the, some uh, blows of the carriers etc on the inside we we found another uh, shell of, of uh, well cut stones of ashlar masonry but in this case the stone could be different because the stone is protected by the by the building but in the middle what is sometimes 80%, many times 80% of the wall is made of uh, rubble masonry. That is the, the results of the demolition of the previous building, the, re the rest of the, of the cutting of the stones, etc. That mix it with mortar with, uh, of not very good quality. And the quality of the mortar depends on the position of the wall. No? So, if we want to build a, a theory about this, uh, these structures, if we want to analyze these structures with our modern mentality, what can we say about this uh, material masonry, which conforms this wall? No? Um, it is easier to, to begin with what we cannot say. So, we cannot say that it is homogeneous. We cannot say that it is isotropic. We cannot say that it has definite elastic properties. We cannot say how is the connection of this wall with the but with the counterfort or even with the soil. Summarizing, we cannot say anything which the computer asks us to run the computer program. We have not the information to put this into a conventional finite element computer program. Okay, then what can we say? This is, uh, I have discovered it is particularly difficult for engineers and architects today, but it is very simple and any mason, any mason today would understand this uh, perfectly. 
if we press two stones, uh, then we can press a lot. Uh, but if we pull the stones separate, that is, masonry is a material which must work in compression. Indeed, the word uh, structure comes from the Latin struere, which means to pile up, but to pile up to form a safe construction. There are infinite varieties of masonry, uh, from uh, uh, just rubble masonry, more or less uh, concerted masonry, ashlar of different types, Roman concrete, etc. What can we say? If we want to, to obtain the, the, this modern uh, uh, strength characteristics like the uh, uh, breaking strength, it is uh, an impossible task because the strength is not depending only on the stone and the mortar, but on the form of the stone, on the geometry of the joints, and even on the pre-existence of cracks, which are, we will see are always present. So uh, a table with the resist, resistance, the strength of the stones is only an indication of, of, of the strength of the masonry, which is a, a structure in itself. Nonetheless, in the 19th century, they used to, to form this kind of tables, which expresses the uh, the limit size of, of some theoretical buildings. For example, uh, with uh, uh, basalt de sweat, you could build a tower of six kilometers, basalt d'Auber, seven kilometers, etc. Um, this means that the, uh, the usual stones, even uh, bricks, for example, with uh, good bricks, you can build a, a tower of almost 300 meters. Uh, we, looking at this table, we, we should know that the, maybe the strength is not a problem. I mean, uh, the impossible problem of uh, knowing the exact strength of a masonry may be not relevant at all. Uh, indeed, we compare the, the the working uh, stresses in, in big buildings, and we compare with the, the breaking stresses of uh, masonry. Uh, the, even in the biggest buildings, there is a big difference. For example, the, in the piers of the cathedral in Bobe, the, the stress, the mean stress at the, at the bottom of the pillars is only 1.3 uh, Newton square millimeter or uh, 13 kilograms square centimeter. That, that is uh, nothing for a reasonably well uh, done uh, masonry. Uh, in the mean stress at the base of the piers of the, uh, which support the dome of St. Peter's, which weighs uh, 30,000 tons, and I don't know how, uh, the tambour is 10,000 tons, and I don't know how many thousand tons are the, uh, the arches and the pillars themselves. The mean stress is only 1.7 newton square millimeter or 17 uh, kilograms square centimeter. So there is not a problem of strength. And then um, this was well known by, by the engineers and architects in the 19th century, and uh, the main contribution to this uh, field of masonry structure was made in the 1960s by Professor Jax Heyman, uh, which uh, realized, demonstrated that if we assume only three properties to the material, the whole uh, theory could be uh, uh, put inside the uh, more general theory of limit analysis. Um, we assume that there is no problem of strength, that is, that masonry in principle will not uh, fail by a lack of strength in compression. And this uh, hypothesis is uh, against safety because there is no material with infinite strength. But uh, the real thing is that in 95% or most of the cases, there is no problem of strength. Zero tensile strength, the, the stones could separate, and, and this is uh, in favor of uh, safety because there is al always some adherence of the mortar. And the th third condition is that uh, the structure is so built that uh, 
the stones don't slide. And this is uh, a reasonable uh, hypothesis because the friction coefficient uh, between the stones is very high, and also because the, the master masons uh, built so that sliding is impossible. So we are going to make only these three assumptions to try to understand uh, uh, masonry structures. Um, the, the, the fact that masonry must work in compression imposes a, a, a geometrical condition. The forces must uh, trans be transmitted within the masonry. There is no possibility of forces outside the masonry. And when the forces are tangent to the uh, border of the masonry, then a hinge forms. And the formation of this hinge is crucial in the development of the theory. Let's ex examine uh, a very simple case extracted by the book by Gordon, Structures of Why Things Don't Fall Down. We have two blocks of, of two, two stones. And the resultant of the forces above the plan AB is in the center, there is no problem. If it moves a little to the left, well, it is still good. It is move, move a little more, it is still good. But the, when the force approaches the border, then there is a tendency of overturning. And when the, the force is outside, if we apply the three uh, conditions, the material has uh, good strength, so it, it can be supported in a very small uh, part, which forms like a hinge. The two stones separate and there is no sliding. Then the only possibility of failure is that of overturning. So the, the failure is a problem not of strength, but a problem of stability. If we examine now four blocks, uh, then if they are under their own weight, there is no problem. If there is some external force, then we compose the, the force, uh, the inclined force with the weight of each one of the blocks. Then we obtain a, a line of resultants, which is called a thrust line. And in each section, the safety is not um, due to the stress level, which are always very low, but because of the distance of the resultant to the border of the uh, of the masonry. So in the first uh, joint, there is no problem. In the second, there is no problem. But then uh, in the last section on the floor, the, the resultant is still inside the masonry, but it is very near. If the inclined force increases uh, uh, a little, then um, maybe the whole wall will uh, fall down. Uh, we may solve this situation in two ways. No? What would do a modern architect or engineer? No? Because he may double the, the thickness of the wall and then there is no problem. What did the Gothic masters did? Uh, uh, they added some weight and adding some weight, they centered the trajectory of resultants inside the wall. Then, for example, in some cases, big sculptures or big pinnacles are not only a decoration, they are put there by the architect or master mason to stabilize the, uh, the wall or the external batteries. If during a conservation or a research or trying to restore the, the sculpture or the pinnacle, which uh, this should be done maybe every 200 years because of or 300 years because of the action of, of, of the weathering, water and wind, etc. Then uh, we should do some previous calculations because maybe if we remove this load, uh, the, the whole uh, structure will collapse. Um, and this implies a completely different uh, way of thinking. Of, of what is the modern way of thinking, focus always in strength. For a modern architect or engineer to remove weight is always good. And we see clearly that in this case, in masonry to remove weight must be done always with uh, uh, some caution. Well, this line, which is the, uh, I, I don't know, I know that this is a, uh, uh, the audience is mainly architects and archaeologists, uh, but this line is the locus of the uh, point of action of the resultant by a system of flames, is what we call line of thrust. And we are going to try to explain what is the line of thrust in the most simple terms. 
in a, in a wall, it is very easy to understand what is the line of thrust. We are composing uh, one force known with the weights of the stones, which is known, and we obtain only one line of thrust. Uh, the arch is much more complicated. No? Uh, for example, we are, we are going to use this uh, Truscan arch uh, as an example. Um, the, the, the stone masons have first in the floor made a real size drawing of the profile of the arch. Then they have decided the thickness of the arch. They have cut templates to, to cut the stones. They built a centering supported on the, on the floor or, or, or in these uh, uh, small stones at, at the, the springing of this arch. And then you are putting the, the stones on one side on the other until you arrive to the keystone. And once the keystone is in place, you can remove the centering and the arch uh, stays uh, free. And this is like a kind of a miracle because the same force that tends to, uh, to throw the stones to the earth maintains the stones in the air. Um, if we concentrate on the keystone, we see that uh, there will be a force, which is the weight of the stone, trying to to uh, uh, to move the stone towards the earth and it is, this is uh, not possible because the, on the two joints there are a certain distribution of small forces or stresses with a resultant and these resultants are in equilibrium no? so the, this uh, resultant on the left and on the right cut on the same point to the weight of the stone this is uh, the first condition of equilibrium. Uh, momentum equilibrium is zero. The vertical components of the forces on both sides uh, sum the, the, exactly the weight of the stone. And what is crucial is that the horizontal components are equal. And if we uh, reproduce the same analysis on every joint, this horizontal component uh, transmit through the arch and so in any, any masonry arch is thrusting with an inclined thrust. It is not possible to build a masonry arch which do not thrust. So the arch is always uh, thrusting. Uh, there is a, a very old uh, Arab proverb which says, the arch never sleeps. So the arch is thrusting always, no? even during the night. And there are only two problems in the design of uh, uh, vaulted architecture to design an arch which uh, will not collapse that is an arch with a, a form and a, uh, and a thickness uh, to permit this transmission of compressions and then to provide abutments which will resist, resist this the thrust of the arch um, elementary statics uh, permit us to, to try to, un to understand this transmission of forces. No? This is a drawing of the uh, middle of the 19th century by an engineer trying to explain the idea of line of thrust. Uh, a demi arch will collapse. Uh, we need to put a, a force on the, on, 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 on the keystone. And this force is composing, following the parallelogram of forces in, with every weight of the stones and produce a, a transmission of forces which has the form of the antifunicular of forces. So um, we will make this drawing in this way, uh, differentiating the antifunicular with the uh, polygon of forces. And it is evident that uh, varying the, the magnitude of the force at the keystone, we may obtain different uh, uh, line of thrust inside the arch. So there are not one solution of equilibrium in compression, but infinite. To avoid that the arch falls down, we may put another half arch. And this is what Leonardo da Vinci wrote in one of his booklets, un arco non en alto que una forteza causata da du de bolleci. So we, we may use this idea of working with uh, half arches and understanding that two half arches uh, form a very, very safe and stable structure. And this is another model to, to try to understand the thrust of arches made by another engineer in England. 
Uh, this is an arch form uh, by Boussois, and the joints are formed by a small uh, flat pieces of wood. And if the thrust line is this most peralted one, uh, then I can remove uh, uh, not the, the top uh, uh, strip of wood because it is compressed, but the other, the other three, yes. And in the next section, I can remove the, the upper stripe, but not the second, but the three and four. And then in this way, uh, with working with the model, we can uh, visualize different uh, uh, trajectories of a, a compressive equilibrium in the arch. They are infinite, but they are not uh, uh, arbitrary. They are all related. No? This is another uh, model with convex joints, so that the point of, of contact uh, uh, set as uh, set uh, where is the, the transmission of forces. But the most uh, important idea uh, and the most useful idea, one of the most uh, uh, fruitful ideas in the history of structural design is due to Robert Hooke. Robert Hooke uh, in 1675. Robert Hooke is a very peculiar uh, a man, he uh, was curator in the Royal Society, so he was in charge of the experiments and he worked uh, for uh, uh, Boyle and he was colleague of uh, Isaac Newton and Christopher Wren. Uh, Robert Hooke was not only a scientist, he was an architect. Uh, after the, the fire of the city in uh, 1666, he was uh, in charge. He was the the the, the main surveyor to to, to rebuild the, the the city of London. Uh, the second uh, after uh, Christopher Wren, and he designed and built uh, many churches. Uh, so he was also an experienced architect, and and he produced this uh, sentence trying to explain the the equilibrium of arches. No. Um, he was. Uh, he pro published this sentence as an anagram to to have the priority of this uh, idea. Uh, and when the cipheret, the anagram said, "Ut pendet continuum flexibly, sic stabi continuum rigidum inversum, as hence the flexible line, so but inverted will stand the rigid arch." And this is the uh, the, the great idea of, of Robert Hooke to realize that the statics of uh, hanging uh, chains or cables and arches is the same. In the hanging chain, everything works in tension, and if we invert the chain, everything works in compression. And the, uh, the ideal form of an arch is that of an uh, inverted catenary. Um, 20 years later, uh, another English scientist David Gregory uh, completed, well, quoted exactly almost word by word the, the, the sentence by Hooke. So there was uh, some leak. Um, and he added so the, 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 uh, the perfect arch is the inverted catenary, but when an arch of any other fiber is supported, it is because in, in its thickness there is some catenary included, uh, as in the figure. And this is a very early, uh, early uh, formulation of the safe theorem of limit analysis. That is, we can think very easily in, um, in hanging uh, chains, and we uh, appreciate immediately that uh, for a, an arch of uh, uniform thickness, which will have a thread line very nearly as a catenary, we need some thickness. And this property is independent of size. So it is a geometrical property. And we may also devise uh, models for analyzing more complex structures like a bridge. No? Uh, we have a main chain, and this uh, main chain supports uh, uh, these weights, which represent the action of the, of the filling on uh, forming the, the road over the arch bridge. Indeed, uh, Gaudi uses this idea uh, it is not easy to obtain the, the question of the catenary. It is even less easy to obtain the, the question of this catenary of non-uniform thickness. And uh, Gaudi, what, what did Gaudi is to to uh, to make uh, 
uh, models of real size and then to uh, to obtain uh, experimentally the form of the of the arches which he, then he constructed for example in the in the casa mila in, in barcelona well another property of masonry which is of course a consequence of the hypothesis we have we have made with the nature of the material it is a material which must work in compression so uh, when it there is some uh, movement it must crack so it is not like uh, wood or, or steel which uh, can resist uh, bending masonry don't resist bending so in the case of an arch if there is uh, some spring of the abutments then to adapt to this spreading of the abutments because the arch thrust the soil is not rigid and the abutments uh, separate a little then the arch must crack and this uh, cracked arch is a completely safe structure and this is uh, one of the main uh, uh, results of this uh, Heyman theory is that of interpreting in in a rational way cracking in masonry because cracking is everywhere in masonry and cracking is natural is not uh, a defect of masonry it is precisely the capacity of forming uh, cracks which gives plasticity and robustness and safety to uh, masonry we can study the cracking and, and working with simple models we see that the same arch can produce different crackings and uh, it is obvious that an structure which is say five centuries old has moved a long history due to changes in the soil to the action of external loads etc and the masonry thanks to the possibility of cracking can adapt in any case to these movements uh, this uh, photograph of a little church in the north of spain uh, has this uh, cracking and, and and the the drawing uh, on on the bottom is not exaggerated this is the actual deformations and we we know that this uh, chart stood in this distorted uh, state for three centuries so we may say that uh, uh, cracks are experimentally in this case uh, not uh, dangerous because uh, something which exists for three centuries is not dangerous um, Cracking is natural in a no tension material. The collapse of arches uh, was studied also uh, in the 18th century, and the collapse of arches, as we have seen at the beginning of this lecture, is not due to a, a, a matter of strength, but of the forming of enough cracks, hanging cracks, which produce a mechanism of collapse for example if we consider uh, this arch which uh, will have uh, an, an inverted catenary inside if we apply it uh, a vertical load uh, at a certain distance it is uh, like we pull from the chain and the chain changes uh, the geometry uh, so we we begin with p equal zero and then the, the, there is no deformation in the chain and then the chain is deformed uh, as uh, speed grows and there is a moment when the chain is just contained inside the arch and the chain the inverted chain touches in four points and these four points are four hanging racks and then the arch collapses and this can be uh, uh, proved experimentally in models or even in the 1970s the destroyed this uh, this bridge which was going to be demolished an engineer of the 19th century would think that this was a waste of money because it was well known in the 19th century that cracks occur in buildings and um, Peronet, for example and his disciples were not uh, much uh, uh, worried about this the safety of arches the safety of arches uh, the, the, the safe theorem of limit analysis says that uh, in very simple terms that if, if it's possible to draw a thread line inside the arch so that everything is working in compression, the arch is safe. That means that it will not collapse. Uh, this simple result is the consequence of a, a very sophisticated and highly mathematical theory, but as any good theory, the, the, the results are simple and very fiable. 
that's to say the arch on the top is small, the catenary is inside, and the property of the catenary being inside is not a matter of the size of the arch, but of the form of the arch. And this arch maybe on top is 10 meters, there's no problem, 20 meters, uh, 30 meters, and probably the limit of, of, of size of arches is around two kilometers. Um, this is not my opinion, but uh, the French engineer Fresine calculated that this was the limit of, of unreinforced uh, concrete arches. So safety is a matter of geometry. Uh, the, the, the first line must be inside the arch, but with uh, enough uh, safety. So if we reduce the thickness of the arch, there is a moment where there is a limit thickness that is it is no longer there is only one uh, inverted catenary inside the arch and then the arch will collapse forming by symmetry uh, five cracks in each studying the, the way of collapsing uh, limit arches we may extract some conclusions of design for example this is a limit arch and there is uh, only one uh, uh, line of thrust inside and the collapse of the arch is by uh, the sending of the keystone and overturning of the haunches. If we want to prevent this, we put some filling. And this is the typical section of a barrel vault, Romanesque or Baroque or Renaissance. And this filling, which uh, this is, uh, gives a way for the thrust going inside and diffusing towards the counterforce, this filling is a structural. It is not neat that it is a very good masonry. Uh, Sometimes it's earth mixed with mortar, but it is necessary. Um, again, we, uh, if we think only in terms of strength, as uh, modern engineers and architects uh, do, then we may think that this is an excess of weight and we may would like to remove this feeling. This is a very dangerous operation and, and it has produced some collapses. In the case of pointed arches, uh, the limit arch is uh, much more slender because the, the catenary adapted better, the arch adapted better to the form of the catenary. And uh, what is curious is that the collapse of the arch is by raising of the, of the keystone. And then the way to stabilize is to put a weight uh, on, on top, like uh, the Gothic masters did, and then to put some filling on, on, on the haunches. Uh, this is a drawing of the mid 19th century and on the right on the left side you see the the catenary outside of the arch and how adding the weight almost the direction of the thrust coincides until at some point you need to put the, the filling as it is uh, seen here so what is the ideal arch so gaudi arch which is the form of an inverted catenary where all the stones are different with different values of curvature. So you need a template for every single stone or the Gothic arch with a simple geometry, all the stones are equal. And then you need to put only a bigger stone, a certain filling to make the arch safe. So Gaudi built his arches uh, for very rich uh, uh, patrons in a, in a time of, uh, of uh, eco economic wellness in, in Catalonia, in Spain. In this arch, for example, the Devil Bridge in Martorell, there are many Devil Bridges in the world. And this uh, little tower on, on top of the arch, it is not only there to control the pass through the bridge, it is an essential part of the structure. If we dismount this tower uh, for restoration and make no no calculation before we may have a desirable surprise no maybe the arch will distort this for sure and maybe it will collapse so to uh, uh, to modify the the geometry uh, and the equilibrium of a mission structure must be made with uh, much care if ever so to analyze uh, equilibrium, we can use very simple tools. Uh, this is a message for archaeologists and architects. Uh, you don't need to, to know anything about tensors or uh, uh, linear algebra, etc. No? Just simple statics. For example, this bridge uh, calculated in around 1900, you have in this drawing of graphic analysis, all the elements of 
of relevant to the checking of the structure and you see that the uh, the main thrust line is well inside the arch so the, this uh, arch is uh, in safe equilibrium there are uh, the first to use uh, graphic statics not only to check the stability but to design new forms was uh, Gaudi Anthony Gaudi was uh, maybe the first uh, uh, modern structural designer and in the uh, retaining porticos on Parkwell he designed this new form trying to conform to the way of the forces distributing in compression through these inclined uh, pillars and, and you can produce uh, also modern programs to to avoid the use to the square and the rule but uh, but the, the, the same thing that uh, are, is made by the computer you can make it by hand so it is a matter of, of taste and then you can uh, use calculus and you can write of course uh, computer programs no? the, the first uh, to to propose a, a way of uh, analyzing a system of rigid blocks in in dry contact was as far as i know Lipsley in 1978 and this is a problem of, of uh, linear programming um, and then afterwards now there are this discrete element method which has uh, their limits and then uh, you can st study some uh, some difficult problems but in general with graphic statics is enough for example uh, in 1898 uh, venuville made a graphic statics uh, equilibrium of the cathedral in beauvais and he obtained of course a very safe equilibrium state no, no surprise because the uh, the cathedral has been standing for uh, almost eight centuries by then. With the same ideas, we can analyze any masonry structure as complicated as it may be. For example, domes. Uh, we may, to analyze a dome, to obtain uh, an equilibrium solution in compression, we imagine the dome divided by uh, meridian plants in, in, in orange slices um, and every two orange uh, slice opposite orange slices form an arch and if it is possible to draw a thread line inside this arch then the broken or cut dome will be stable and so the real dome which is not cut or not totally cracked will be safe and this idea was used by Polleni uh, in 1748, uh, Polony here of the idea of Hook, and then he uh, imagined the, the dome of St. Peter's divided in 50, uh, in 50 slices. He imagined every slice divided in 17 voussoirs, calculated the weight of each voussoir and formed a, a, a hanging chain of, with the weights of this voussoir. These balls, uh, great balls, are representing the weight of the lantern and then he inverted the chain and he saw that the chain was inside and he uh, concluded that the cracks which were visible and have been causing a lot of distress in Rome were uh, uh, irrelevant for the stability of the dome and this can be made in a couple of hours this is a, a student exercise of one of my courses on, on masonry historic masonry structures so this is the the dome of the golden Gumbath in bijapur 39 meters uh, and um, the students after some maybe two months of training in, in graphic statics can can make the uh, can draw this uh, line of thrust so and the, the line of thrust is inside the middle the middle half of the of the thickness so we have a geometrical coefficient of at least two and again there is no surprise that we obtain a very good uh, situation in a dome which has stood 500 years no? what happens if uh, my my line of thrust is outside but then uh, what happens is i am wrong i mean uh, nature is not wrong the experiment is made the the, the building has stood for 500 years so any 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 analysis must result in an, in an explanation of not only of this equilibrium but of this safe equilibrium domes thrust radially and crack when the tumble yields and these cracks are 
present in all the domes, sometimes are very tiny and invisible, but for example in the Pantheon, when Beltrami removed parts of the uh, intonacato or the, the plaster, the, plast the external plastering of the coffin, they appear these big cracks. And these cracks were there, and, uh, evidently since the, uh, the time of settlement of the foundations, maybe 20 or 30 years after the, the, the finishing of the dome. That means that these cracks are maybe 1,850 years old or something like that. Uh, Terencio, in the 1930s, uh, remove all the uh, all the uh, plaster of the intrados and uh, made a survey of all the cracks. And uh, Terencio, uh, with great uh, uh, rationality, just uh, closed the the, the 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 cracks from the outside to 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 establish the aspect of the covering but he didn't even pretend to to fill the the cracks no this is not necessary the, the 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 dome is safe with the cracking and even terencio said that the dome was safer because it has cracked it will be a long discussion this but it is uh, it is true and the the form of the cracks can uh, say uh, many things to to the researcher or the or the architect or the engineer. No, for example, if the the movement is more evident in one part, then the cracks are uh, showing the, the 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 direction of the movement. And and in Santa Maria del Fiore, for example, the the main cracks are uh, following the the lines of weakness. The Gothic structure. The Gothic structure is not like St. Peter's or the Roman structures, it is a delicate structure uh, built by a reduced number of very skilled uh, uh, masons. So they use a small stones, a small stone, I mean a stone which a man, a stone of maybe 50 kilograms and a square, a cubic uh, foot is, uh, and in the, in the hundreds of uh, medieval illustrations we see always uh, very inefficient cranes and light scaffolds to move these small stones. And with these small stones, they built the cathedrals. If it is impressive to see the, the equilibrium of the Finnish cathedral, uh, what is more impressive is to think that in every step of the construction, the cathedral was in equilibrium. So, and in this uh, drawing by Aguk, it is uh, uh, explained more or less rightly this uh, intermediate uh, step of construction. The basis of the Gothic architecture is the cross vault. We, we spoke about this and we may use the idea of the hanging chain of, of hook to, to have uh, um, an approximation, a very good approximation of the functioning. So we consider that there are two main chains uh, coinciding with the cross arches and with uh, from these two main chains are hanging uh, smaller chains and from these smaller chains are hanging the, the stones. If we invert this, we obtain a, 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 a spatial uh, uh, system of thrust lines and if this spatial system is inside the masonry, then the, the cross vault is uh, in safe equilibrium. Um, there are other ways to, to imagine the transmission of forces. For example, Paul Abram uh, imagined that the forces will follow the, the same uh, uh, path of a, a ball sliding freely. And then we, have, we arrive to the same idea that the forces are concentrated on the, on the, on the ribs. And any analysis uh, which leads to a uh, possible equilibrium solution in compression is valid, and this is uh, the main result of the safe theorem of, of, of Heyman. And then, in general, we may divide uh, any any Gothic vault in a system of elementary arches, calculate the line of thrust in, in each of these arches, and this uh, force uh, these reactions at the, at the extremes of this uh, elementary arch are the actions in the in the cross ribs, and in this way we can study the equilibrium of any uh, Gothic vault as complicated as it might be. This was made uh, around 1900. This is extracted from a, 
Hamburg uh, that architecture 1901 and it is a, a quite simple uh, exercise on graphic statics and I have put this example for the students and they are able to solve this in two hours. Graphic statics is very good in plane so for symmetrical structures etc. What happens uh, for a completely irrelevant non-symmetrical structure like the church of the colonial well designed by Gaudi. Then um, you will need maybe a computer now uh, or a model. No? And what did Gaudi was built a model uh, uh, calculating the weights and calculating the areas on the weights and using a, a balance uh, weighting the, the, the the different parts and forming chains and these chains form an, uh, uh, an, a hanging skeleton and then Gaudi took a, a photograph and then uh, on the photograph he painted with uh, with tempera or wash and he looked at the at the solution and maybe he he changed and this is a photograph of the of the model uh, the scale is 1 to 20 uh, built by Gaudi and he worked with this model for uh, some 20 years, not not all the time, but uh, and it, uh, he had the help of, of some of his disciples. And what you see is the the, the, the hanging model, and and these are not uh, not fabric. These are a very very light paper, just to 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 obtain the volume of the form. And then he uh, made a photograph, and then he painted on. On, over the photograph, and he made many, many uh, trials. So, as uh, the uh, great architectural historian George Collins said, the uh, model was a, a designing machine. No? Um, the the horizon, the horizontal component of the thrust of the of the of the bolts. Uh, another. Uh, um, if not invention, another development of the Gothic master was to uh, transmit this horizontal component of the inclined uh, force uh, through a, a, a particular arch, the flying buttress, to the external buttress. And, and it is possible to study these statics again. And what is interesting is that the, the Gothic uh, has the, 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 I don't know, the compromises of not copying i mean there are uh, i don't think there are two uh, equal system of buttressing in the gothic the, every master uh, try to to think in another way the, this is so different for example from for uh, byzantine churches you cannot distinguish they are all, all very similar no and what is amazing is that all these different systems uh, are in equilibrium and were designed uh, without computer. Uh, cross, uh, cross bolts uh, cracks, and these cracks are irrelevant. This is the only way to adapt to the movement of the, of the buttresses or the foundations. You can study the different types of cracks and, and with uh, some experience you can interpret uh, the movements. Uh, cracks and equilibrium are uh, depending on, on geometry and if the geometry is right uh, the safety is a matter of geometry and not uh, independent of size. This is the result for example of the analysis of, of, of Bobe. Um, if we build a model of sufficient uh, size or on a small charge and it stays, then we can build safely a bigger charge and this will be safe again in proportional design. Some cases are really uh, impressive. Uh, the case of Palma de Mallorca or well, even the case of Hagia Sophia, no? these great structures which has no precedent. In the case of Palma de Mallorca, the vaults are uh, has a height of uh, 44 meters, not as high as uh, Bove, but the span is uh, almost 20 meters and the pillars are extremely slender. And the, the lateral uh, vaults thrust against the void. No? I mean, the, this slender pillar 
it appears that which uh, couldn't resist the thrust of the vault. Um, Ruby Belver, a disciple of Gaudí, Gaudí worked also in the Cathedral of Mallorca, made an static analysis of the of the cathedral, and in this drawing we can see what happens. Uh, uh, Gaudí uh, liked it to to make the composition of forces in the same drawing, no? not separate in a polygon of forces. And here we see these segments are the uh, at a force scale, the the thrust of the lateral. Uh, naves and the vertical segment is the weight on top and you see that what they did is to put a lot of weight on top even charging the the, uh, the central bosses with uh, with these great pyramids of ashlar masonry or the transverse arches with these uh, uh, great walls made of solid masonry just to increase the weight in such a way that uh, the force in the pillar is not vertical, but it is almost vertical, and it is safely inside of the pillar. And the result is that uh, if you uh, increase the weight, you increase the horizontal thrust, and uh, the, the water system of Palma de Mallorca is probably the biggest water system of, of the Gothic. And this is the result of a design uh, decision. I want very slender pillars, and the uh, the central nave uh, elevated from the lateral nave so that light enters and the price of this uh, 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 clear space inside is this massive uh, amount of masonry outside so uh, the masonry must be in 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 compressive equilibrium and this leads to proportional design and this is could be seen maybe just comparing drawings the santa sofia in salonica is uh, one third the size of santa sofia in in Hagia sofia in in, in istanbul uh, but uh, not only the, the the thickness of the elements are similar that but even in the Hagia sofia uh, the elements look slender as in the smaller uh, Hagia Sophia in Salonica. For uh, again, for modern architects and engineers, this is uh, uh, difficult to accept. And, and the first to to criticize this proportional design was uh, Galileo. Galileo was the founder of the science of strength of materials, and he uh, formulated this the so so called square cube law. So in a for example, uh, in an animal, the weight uh, raises with the cube of the dimensions, and the section of the elements raises with the uh, with the square of the, of, of the of, of the dimension. So, uh, bigger animals animals will need uh, disproportionately thicker uh, uh, bones. Um, well, this is true if the problem is a problem of strength. If we apply the, the the law of Galileo to a dome. Then uh, this is San Biagio in multiple channel is uh, 14 meters span. Then uh, three times 14 meters, 42 meters. That is San Peter. And then after Galileo, uh, the thickness should be as in the drawing, no? Which is not. In fact, if we draw uh, San Biagio, San Peter, San Santa Maria del Fiore at uh, the same size, the the geometry is very similar. Even they are very different in structures. And uh, if we draw uh, in a real size, for example, Santa, Santa Tomas de Oya, uh, then we see that the, the, the sizes uh, vary enormously, but the proportions between the span and the thickness are more or less similar. No? So this uh, proportional rule uh, appears to be at least empirically correct. Uh, Jufre in one of his books, for example, compares the Pantheon with the, this is one of the Roman temples, I don't remember the name, the proportion is, is the same, and the, the, the German archaeologist Gunther Rasch, uh, who made a, a very thorough and complete study of the geometry of, of, of Roman domes, deduce a, a, a rule, you know, the, the, the thickness of the, of the tambour of a, of a of a circular temple with a hemispherical dome is 
one seventh of the span. And it is precisely one seventh of the span in the case of the Pantheon and of this Roman temple. Um, so we have the evidence of this uh, geometric uh, proportional rules of a structural design. Uh, from medieval times, we have received very little. Uh, in, in late Gothic, uh, there were some manuscripts with evidence of uh, Gothic rules, for example, in, in Spain, in Martinez de Aranda, or in Blondel, uh, he uh, quotes this uh, geometrical rule, uh, saying explicitly that it is a, a Gothic rule. Um, if we apply this rule uh, to, uh, to Gothic buildings, uh, we obtain a, a similar, not, not exactly, but uh, similar proportions. And again, uh, Rodrigo Gilion Tanion uh, used uh, uh, proportional rules to design the, the ribs um, of, of a Gothic, uh, late Gothic Spanish vault. Um, uh, Rodrigo Gilion Tanion is a very interesting case because he was in the water set between uh, Middle, Age, uh, Middle Ages and Renaissance. No? So he tried to combine the, the Gothic proportions with the human body and well, more or less he succeeded. For the design of domes, uh, Carlo Fontana produced a, a geometrical uh, a rule for simple domes uh, based in the study of existing uh, domes in the city of Rome. And uh, no, this is not Fontana, this is Bitone. On the right is Bitone, I still insists in this kind of uh, geometrical rules. That the, that the, the uh, the traditional structural designers were not uh, concerned with the size, but only with the geometry. For example, among many other proofs is that of the design made by Leonardo da Vinci for a bridge over the Golden Horn in Istanbul. No? He uh, made this, this design for the Sultan uh, for a bridge of uh, with a free span of 240 meters. And um, well, he was not much worried. He worried about the centering and um, uh, this kind of things, but he, he had no doubt that it was possible to build an arch of 240 meters. And in the 1950s, uh, a Swiss engineer, Fritz Stussi, made a, an analysis and he demonstrated that it would have been possible to build this bridge. So what is the, the essence of the, the safety of, of masonry? The, the essence of the safety is equilibrium in compression and uh, the uh, right geometry. So the, the concentration of the old masters was in geometry and uh, evidently uh, an instructor which has a, a right geometry is safe. Uh, so in, in the case of analysis of existing structures, we should be aware that this geometry is empirically uh, correct. We may look for details, what has happened in the inside of the masonry, what has happened maybe in variation of the conditions, but the problem of equilibrium is a problem of geometry. It is the, the, the problem of, of, of a balance, not the, the children playing with uh, these uh, uh, block toys are well aware that if they reproduce the form but bigger, they will be stable. No? This something so simple is essential and apparently very difficult to, to, to accept by modern architects and engineers. So I will finish with this slide. This is the frontispiece of the first, the first uh, treatise on bridges uh, by Gautier, 1717. Um, this woman on the picture is uh, architecture, which was represented by a woman. And this woman is drawing a bridge, designing a bridge. And there is a landscape of, of bridges with sur basic arches, uh, semicircular arches, pointed arches. There are drawings of the, the tools, uh, the, the square and the, the level, etc., the hammer. And in the center of the picture, there is a, a balance. And in a balance, there are two arches. On the left side, there is a pointed arch. And on the right side, there is a semicircular arch. And the balance inclines to the side of the semicircular arch. Why? Because uh, semicircular arches thrust more than pointed arches. And then in the, in the sentence, it says, ut pondera libra 
seek edifici architectura, as you wait with a balance, so is built architecture. So masonry architecture is a matter of equilibrium, and equilibrium is a matter of geometry. And we can arrive to this conclusion with a highly sophisticated theory, the, the product of the work of many intelligent people for decades, that is limit analysis and the genius of a man like Professor Heyman, or you can arrive to this conclusion just looking at the, at the buildings without all the preconception and distrust which uh, is in the mind of uh, our more modern mind. Um, if you want to follow this, uh, this track, uh, then you, of course, in the universities, we, uh, this uh, matter is not, is not taught, which is, I think is, is a great anomaly in, 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 in Spain, in Italy, in England, in France, uh, the, the title of architect or engineer ability to inter make intervention in historic masonry structures but in the curricula there is nothing about historic masonry structures no so it is the same as if a physician or a doctor received the title but has no information about the kidney for example no? anyway uh, we are lucky because uh, this man professor Heyman has uh, published many 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 books and articles the, the, main, uh, the main book for anyone trying to enter into this field is The Stone Skeleton, which has been translated recently into Italian, the Skeleto di Pietra, and also in, into Spanish. And in Spain, in the Instituto Juan de Herrera, we have been translating not all, but many of the, of the contribution of Professor Heyman, because uh, I think that uh, uh, we think that this is the the only way to to appreciate something is to uh, to understand and uh, respect is a, a quality which was associated to knowledge we cannot appreciate and respect anything which you don't understand if we don't understand anything something the, the the feeling is that of distrust and fear and this distrust and fear is uh, uh, on the base of many many interventions which are damaging the the architectural patrimony today. Well, uh, thank you for your attention. Now, I suppose there, there may be some uh, some questions. Okay. Thank you very much, Santiago, for your wonderful presentation. Let me say, fascinating pre presentation, since uh, you gave us uh, some point of view that uh, allows for clearly and immediately visualize uh, complex concepts. So, thank you. Uh, now, uh, if something want to say, uh, some consideration or ask questions, passo all'italiano che forse è meglio per i ragazzi, non abbiate vergogna, so che l'inglese può essere ovviamente una, una barriera in più. Però... Io ho capito l'italiano, io non parlo l'italiano, io l'ho capito. Allora, le domande sono possibili in italiano, facciamo così, così tanto il professor Huerta le capisce lo stesso. Mi farebbe piacere, anche perché io non conosco molti di voi, perché naturalmente stiamo facendo da pochissimo questo cammino insieme, e mi farebbe piacere soprattutto eh, sentire qualche insomma, commento, qualche impressione, qualche domanda, qualche curiosità che può aver suscitato questa presentazione, che penso che... Uh, innanzitutto ho pensato che sia stato meglio aver fatto la mia presentazione prima di quella di Santiago perché altrimenti poi il paragone sarebbe stato impietoso <ride> e quindi comunque la, la capacità che ha avuto il professor Huerta di ehm, rendere veramente accessibili e facilmente visualizzabili questi concetti anche a chi non ha ovviamente un background no, di, di ingegneria strutturale o di architettura Penso che sia eh, davvero, davvero, come dire, interessante e importante per questa scuola. Allora, coraggio. Beh? I think they are tired. I have spoken uh, too much. Posso rompere il ghiaccio? Vai Maurizio. No, hai parlato del, dell'arco del ponte di Leonardo. 
quello per in Turchia dove a Istanbul, Istanbul. Sì, in, the golden horn, in, Tur in Istanbul l'ingegnere svizzero yes. che stava in piedi o che non stava in piedi che stava in piedi ah. He, 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 he made a, an elastic analysis in the elastic. 1950s, elastic analysis, but even with this elastic analysis, he concluded that the, that the, the bridge would have been safe. It was possible to, to, to build the, the bridge with the proportions uh, drawn by Leonardo. Yes. Tu sai che John Oxendorf ha fatto fare un modello di questo in, con una stampa 3D, lo sapevi? Uh, no, but uh, I, th I think there are some this the, in some publications there have been models of this uh, of this bridge because it, it is also very original because the, mm. it is very modern because it divides uh, the road divides in on the springings and in this way it is more resistant to seismic elements. Mm. Mm. It is uh, well fascinating, no? Mm. But in any case, he was not worried about the size. The, 240 meters. In che materiale dovevano farlo? Ah, well, it, uh, as far as I remember, it was only the, the, the general description in a letter. No, that this is mm. a, a small drawing. Uh, mm. Masonry, any masonry would, would do. Well, any, any good masonry well built. No? Ok. Se posso fare una domanda? Prego, prego. Cosa. Non può sì. dire fare una domanda. La ringrazio. Sono state, ehm, è stato detto che le fratture trovate nella cupola del Pantheon sono state considerate un fenomeno positivo per la sua conservazione. Volevo sapere il motivo. Ecco. Uh, can you translate to me, Aguinaldo? Uh, yes, the student asked that uh, Uh, the um, fracture in the Pantheon Dome uh, yeah. has been considered positive for the conservation of the structure, and uh, he will know something more about this. Hmm. Um, yes, the, well, the, the dome of the Pantheon was uh, was was cracked since since uh, since the settlement of the soils is evident that these cracks uh, are old and, and big. I, I mean, the, it, is, it is maybe, I don't know, maybe 20 or 30 centimeters or, or more, the cracks, no? So they are big cracks. Um, and, and Terenzio, uh, uh, well, and, and these cracks have existed uh, since the settlement of the, of, the, of the foundations. Now there is a, Uh, a laser scanner survey of the Pantheon, which is uh, which is free in internet, uh, uh, it, it may be found. And, and then uh, in this laser scanner, you see that the that the um, uh, the tambour has lean outside. So and, and the only way to adapt to this leaning of the tambour, a little leaning is to, to form of the crack. So there is no doubt that these cracks are old. Um, Um, the intrados of the Pantheon has been uh, restored uh, at least at least uh, in the in the in the middle of the 18th century. Uh, it was restored and, and the, the scaffold is documented because it was a rotating scaffolding and it is drawn in many many carpentry manuals of the, the 19th century. And when they uh, they restore the intrados, these cracks must have appeared. Um, they took no notice. I mean, they, they just covered the cracks. Then uh, Beltrami, at the beginning, at, at the end of the 19th century, was doing some work and, and removed this and uh, uh, do it and discovered one crack, one weak crack. And Anterencio in the 1930s, and he he removed all the all the all the all the mortar in the intrados. And made this detailed survey. Um, th there is uh, there is a, a, a very good book on the on the work of restoration in the Pantheon uh, published by Bilardi, no Bellardi. 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 Sí, sí. Um, and in this book, which is a, a very good book, uh, uh, he quotes a, a letter. I think it is a letter by Terencio, uh, 
that, uh, and he, Ter Terencio said es uh, explicitly that the cracks were good. Uh, why is, is Terencio saying that? Because uh, he had in mind the division on, of the dome in, in slices, no? To study the equilibrium. No? And then he, he, he thought that the, the divided dome was in a better state to, to resist uh, the, the, the forces, no? And that is because it was uh, for him better to understand. But in any case, he just covered the, the crack with, um, with a small, uh, a very thin um, uh, metal, metal, uh, how do you say, uh, metal, uh, metal net, and then projected the mortar on this metal net. Um, I visit, uh, I visit the, the Pantheon with Velardi and also with Gian Giacomo Martinez in, in 2010, and, and, and Velardi gave, gave me uh, his book. Um, and the intervention of Velardi was just the same. So he, uh, uh, the problem was that the, this metal uh, net put by Terencio was has, uh, uh, how do you say, uh, oxidated. Mm -hmm. And then he removed this uh, metal net and, and re replaced it by a, a well, I, I don't know, some kind of uh, plastic net. But the intention was the same, just to cover the crack not to fill the crack, not to put any, 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 any not to stitch the crack with, uh, with a steel or whatever, just to, 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 to leave the crack uh, as it is and just to, to restore the, the, the external appearance. Um, and, and, and we have been very lucky these two times because the, the normal tendency today is when there is a crack, to make anything, to, to close this crack, because uh, cracks now are, by definition, bad. They are a sign of collapse. And with this thing in mind, uh, I cannot imagine what would have happened to the Pantheon uh, if another man, not Velardi, was there. No? Uh, or uh, there is one case, for example, the, the case, this can be researched in, in internet, the case of Santa Maria del Fiore, in Santa Maria del Fiore in the 1980s, they were storing the, the frescoes of Vasari and there were cracks. Of course, there were cracks. And uh, there was a, a big debate about what to do. Um, some proposals were to, to, to make, a, to put a, a, a post-tension uh, ring around the dome of Runeleski and well, to make a, many, 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 many stupid things. Uh, and then, uh, uh, well, they, I, I don't know the story in detail, but in the end, they decided not to do anything, but to monitorize, monitorize the movement. And they discovered that the movements uh, were, um, uh, among other, seasonal. I mean, the, the structure moves, the cracks grow a little in summer and close in winter. So this is a, a matter of the, uh, breathing, no, the structure is breathing, no, it is adapting and moving. Um, this idea of, of the monolithic uh, uh, structure, no, this fantasy, uh, which comes from reinforced concrete, no, because reinforced concrete at the beginning of the 20th century was the perfect material, the eternal material, no, it was in the propaganda eternal. Et we, we know that concrete is not eternal now, concrete is a problem in many buildings which are not even 100 years old. But this idea of that a building should be monolithic, this is terrible. I mean, uh, this is uh, uh, terrible. So, monolithic um, means high stresses. And high no, stresses mon mean monolithic means that, uh, that you need at all costs to avoid cracking. Yes. And cracks are not bad. Cracks are normal to masonry and cracks it is the capacity of cracking which gives plasticity to the uh, masonry structure. If you try to avoid the cracking, then you, you are doing something. Uh, besides, it is impossible to avoid the cracking. I mean, uh, if uh, uh, I, what what is the weight of of a, of a masonry building? Maybe ten thousand tons. No, if, if you want to to impede the movement of ten thousand tons. Uh, then you are in a problem, no? Because it is going to move, no? So, 
And I remembered also, uh, it was for me a discovery in the 1980s, Mario Piana, the, uh, 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 who was the, the, the chief of the superintendenza in Venice, uh, in Venice no? Mario Piana. And he delivered a lecture in, in, in the Architectural Association in Madrid and explained how the traditional structure in, in, in Venice was to not to not to join the walls, but to keep the walls uh, uh, moving. No? I mean, the walls were tied by the by the boots of the uh, the, the, the beams of the of the roofs uh, and the and the and the floors, and in this way the 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 the, the building could can move and adapt in in, in the soil uh, like Venice. And he described the intervention in the 1930s. They put very big reinforced concrete beams. Uh, uh, trying to achieve this monolithism, that trying to to make the, the the building a block, and the results were disastrous, because um, first the, the 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 beam broke, and then the masonry broke, and well anything. No, so uh, I, I I think uh, it is uh, well, it is a very good question, but uh, uh, Terencio. Uh, in 1930s, have still uh, uh, have received a formation within the tradition of masonry, and also he was uh, well aware of the of the of the function of the cracks, and and he made no intervention uh, in the sense of trying to close the cracks or something like that. And Velardi, more recently, and this is uh, remarkable, uh, has, has has had also the 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 sensibility and, and, and the intelligence to not to do nothing, no? Which is, this is another problem, no? Now in the modern mind, uh, if you are called to make an intervention, you make an intervention. <laughs> so uh, you cannot say nothing happens. Well, well, why not? <laughs> why not? I mean, if, if this structure is all right, what is the problem, no? Many times it's a matter of, of painting, no? In, in the city of Anani with Professor Angelillo, uh, there is a building, a Scuola Media, a big building with uh, a medieval part. And this building has been closed and it is closed now more than 10 years because a single crack. There is one single crack in this building in the medieval part. Um, the story, I think it is... It is, uh, it is medie medieval. It's medieval. Mm -hmm. um, and the story is as follows. This uh, just after the earthquake of L'Aquila, which caused so much uh, unrest, um, they, they have a problem, nothing to do with the system. Uh, I mean, they have a problem of water, no? There was, and then the, the firemen went there just to, to, to solve the problem of the water on the from whatever, no? And then the firemen saw the crack. And then, okay, a crack, everybody out all the children, all the teachers, and then a first report, a second report, a third report, until today. No? Because it is very easy no, to say, this is going to fall down. You have no responsibility, no? Well, the, only the responsibility of the children uh, traveling every day 20 kilometers, no? Okay. Quindi, giusto per concludere, volevo aggiungere che è fondamentale nella struttura di muratura l'analisi un, del quadro fessurativo, perché a volte, come dice il professore, che eh, monitorare è meglio che intervenire. Eh, can you translate, Aguinaldo? Yes, uh, he said that uh, when you study an, uh, a mason reconstruction, um, it's uh, very important to study uh, the cracks, the, the whole cracks of construction and, mo and monitoring that cracks instead of uh, intervene. Uh, well, uh, yes, I agree, but, um, but sometimes it is not necessary to monitorize. I mean, a, a normal crack, a typical crack, need no monitoration. I mean, it is, it is you don't need to spend money. Uh, in, in, in some cases... Uh, sorry, Maurizio? Volevo fare un commento. Vabbè, yes. Finisci, finisci, finisci. Ok. Yes. 
sul, su questo problema del, dei quadri fessurativi che noi chiamiamo e che, eh, con i quali noi cominciamo qualunque analisi di una struttura antica va là qualcuno che fa questi quadri fessurativi eh, Antonino Giuffre osservava che il rilievo dei quadri fessurativi è estremamente soggettivo cioè legato a come noi li vediamo e che spesso tutto quello che noi vediamo su questi disegni è del tutto irrilevante cioè perché bisogna capirli cioè quindi se io segno tutti i crack che ci sono su una costruzione di muratura senza un, eh, un pensiero può essere che faccio una cosa dannosa questo è quello che diceva Giuffre quindi eh, vedete cioè distinguere quelli che sono rilevanti da quelli che sono irrilevanti e poi capirne le cause sicuramente però molto spesso noi vediamo dei quadri fessurativi assurdi cioè dove ci sta tutto dentro cioè dove ci sono crack millimetrici che non, hanno, non sono neanche spiegabili con, strutturalmente quindi. quindi forse è meglio dare maggiore rilevanza appunto allo studio perché se è così soggettivo allora non so, un danno esistente su una struttura muraria può essere visto da una persona in un modo da una persona in un'altra però mh, sarebbe non so, il caso di uniformare ecco, il pensiero perché se io vedo una, una frattura regolare su una muratura e, e la sosa ha, una, ha un problema ben preciso e un altro fa la sosa ha un altro problema questo non è abbastanza bene perché io potrei intervenire in un modo, un'altra persona potrebbe intervenire in un altro, quindi sarebbe fondamentale ecco, capire una linea guida. Di... Ma questo è il problema, che è un pensiero ah, ecco. che ancora si deve, secondo me, completamente sedimentare, perché è, è uno dei problemi. Non so se Maurizio è d'accordo. Sì, si è perso un po' la sensibilità verso queste cose, per cui e chi va lì diciamo non, non è che guardando il crack si capisce che la struttura si chiama danno adesso lo chiamano danno ma spesso non è un danno sì. rilievo del danno a me farebbe piacere sentire sempre che non me ne voglia male per questo richiamo io ho visto che c'è la Cinelli che sta seguendo il, il seminario ci sei Maria Grazia? Sì, professore, ci sono. Eh, mi farebbe piacere sentire una domanda fatta da una persona che sta facendo insomma, il suo percorso di studi in restauro. Se ne hai qualcuna, se non ne hai non ti voglio mettere in imbarazzo. Uh, no, non... la questione è diversa. Uh, la uh, lezione del professor Huerta è stata uh, molto precisa. Quindi dal mio punto di vista io non posso fare altro che ehm, prendere spunto dalle sue osservazioni e quindi anche in ambito di restauro, mh, specialmente nel momento in cui sto approfondendo degli aspetti della mia ricerca eh, sulle costruzioni eh, del XVII secolo, non posso che... Ehm, approfittare in maniera molto interessata di quello che ci ha fatto vedere lui oggi anche in merito alle costruzioni in mattoni che sono uno degli elementi che sto analizzando e quindi comprendere come eh, i vari approcci siano stati fondamentali per avere delle strutture eh, che sopravvivono mostrando dei danni che in alcuni casi sono realmente eh, come dicevate eh, di valore nullo in alcuni casi rispetto a quelle costruzioni moderne come abbiamo visto eh, nell'immagine del terremoto dove tutto ciò che era moderno è sparito l'unica costruzione che è rimasta lì solida Uh, e funzionale era la in questo momento mi viene chiesa non so che non è chiesa era la moschea yeah. uh, quindi uh, dal mio punto di vista è questo che ho, ho apprezzato ho apprezzato uh, l'aspetto proprio della tecnica costruttiva della conoscenza intrinseca di come venivano realizzate 
determinati elementi e che proprio la conoscenza della costruzione ha permesso che il danno strutturale in molti casi sia minimo. E, e qui poi c'è tutto un altro discorso che sono anche le capacità delle maestranze, ehm, di come si lavora. Ehm, io mh, uno degli aspetti su cui mi, mi sono interessata anche prima del, eh, del dottorato è eh, stata, come ben sa, questa costruzione in Calabria e ho potuto approfondire eh, degli aspetti delle costruzioni in Calabria a seguito del terremoto di fine Settecento, eh, rendendomi conto che le maestranze locali hanno compreso quali fossero gli errori nelle costruzioni precedenti e hanno cercato di sviluppare delle tecniche costruttive che rispondessero al meglio alle sollecitazioni dovute dai, eh, dai terremoti. E quindi la tecnica costruttiva come evolve, come cambia e come la maestranza locale eh, la trasforma a seconda delle sue necessità. C'è un'evoluzione darwiniana nelle costruzioni storiche, no? C'è una selezione delle soluzioni migliori che emerge. C'è una consapevolezza, io penso che sia una, una consapevolezza da parte delle maestranze, che è un aspetto che ora eh, stiamo pian piano perdendo, eh, nel senso che fino a cent'anni fa eh, la maestranza locale, mh, o il carpentiere, eh, sapeva perché doveva fare una determinata azione di costruzione in cantiere. Sapeva che la doveva fare, ma perché non lo so fino a che punto. Però in alcuni... In al... perché? Tu dici che sapeva anche il perché. Sì, sì, sapeva il perché. Sapeva che doveva mettere quell'elemento in quel determinato punto e lo faceva anche in maniera spontanea. Io lo, in, alcuni, in alcune situazioni eh, si vede questo. Ora invece non abbiamo più delle maestranze consapevoli del lavoro che fanno, nel senso che ehm, forse si è persa la specializzazione, ma è un termine che non mi piace utilizzare, si è persa la voglia di conoscenza, di capire come funziona. Eh, Santiago, about the construction techniques, uh, a question in honor uh, of uh, Professor D'Amato, Uh, you visited him uh, some years ago. Uh, a po the possible influence, some comments uh, uh, on the possible influence of the stereometry, especially when the earthquakes uh, enter in the games. Um, in, in principle, the, the stereotomy it has no influence on the, on the working of, of masonry. As far as, as, as there is no sliding, Um, and, and, and the tradition of, of building is, is just to, to avoid the sliding. I mean, the, the, for example, the, the rule of, of cutting the, the, the joints uh, perpendicular to the line of intrados, it is, it is because of that, no? I mean, it is not only to, 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 to make easy the cutting of the stones, but also to, 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 to avoid, and, and so a sliding in a slender arch is very difficult. Um, in, in, in the case of earthquakes, uh, this is a, a, well, a complicated problem because uh, uh, first, not all, the, not, not all the earthquakes are the same. No? Right. And, and so, uh, historically, uh, I, I mean, I think the main point is that uh, our laboratory is history. I mean, there has been earthquakes for, well, not, forever, no? I mean, since the beginning of civilization, um, and, and, and there is, a, 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 of course, a rational uh, fear for earthquakes because they can be catastrophic, uh, but, uh, but it is also a fact, uh, we, I, I have not studied this, this aspect uh, in detail, no? but uh, for example, in Peru, in, in Peru, uh, they, they, they built uh, normal masonry vaults, uh, Uh, there is a, a Peruvian architect who wrote uh, the, the so-called uh, uh, quincha, quincha, quincha walls, which are uh, uh, they were the, the, the Spaniards built first masonry walls, 
and there was a, a catastrophic uh, earthquake in the I don't know in the 18th century, no, and then the the the, 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 the vice uh, vice king or whatever, no, they the, the, they decided not to build any longer Mason revolts, and they began to build uh, another type of vault, which is the Kincha vault, which is made of pieces of wood and plaster and uh, whatever, no. Okay, and this has functioned uh, for for maybe two two centuries. But uh, if I am well informed, in in the last earthquake, it was very bad for for this for this kind of of, of Kincha structures, and not bad for for the Mason revolts remaining. I mean. Uh, we, we we have we, we should be uh, aware of the, of the of the limits of of the pre predictability of of some kind of uh, natural natural phenomena no? um, or, or for example er earthquakes um, in mexico no with uh, professor angelillo we, we participated two, two years ago there was a big earthquake in in 2017 um, 2017 and the problem was that the uh, the, the frequency of the earthquake was particularly bad for masonry structures, no? because uh, it was uh, and not so bad for modern structures. Um, and there were a, a lot of cracks and, and damages in, in many in many buildings, but um, and so there was a, a great uh, unrest and um, a lot of uh, uh, approaches and interventions. But uh, we were there. Um, Okay, in, in the city of Mexico, uh, one dome collapsed. Not co not totally, half half dome collapsed, and not, not. but there were maybe two hundred domes which didn't collapse. So sh should we? I mean, we cannot get in panic. No, I mean, okay, there was. And, and, and also it was apparent the influence of the maintenance oh, I think the, the in, in, in the cases we we we, we, we visit uh, um, were badly maintained maintained uh, convents abandoned for for decades or or centuries with water entering into the walls and so the walls were no no, no longer masonry proper masonry it was disgregated so of course an earthquake comes and this is like a, a castle of cards no um, so there are many factors and um, another factor was for example the presence of uh, reinforcement uh, uh, with reinforced concrete and this was terrible in, well, in all the cases we saw all the structures uh, reinforced with concrete were in a very bad state and, and many and in many cases the, the 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 origin of the collapse was the addition of this reinforced concrete so uh, we must be very careful no i mean uh, and history uh, history teaches to be careful and to be cautious and and to try to to put the the things in context no and um, and some things we know uh, the, the nature of the material that in in, in many parts of the world uh, they have been building with masonry for hundreds of, of, of years and, and and we cannot just say as i have heard many times that masonry is very bad uh, for earthquakes well this is this is simply nonsense i mean do, do, we cannot begin a discussion with, with su such kind of simple statements which are simply not true so and and the history the, the the detailed study of history of all what happened no because uh, uh, for example in, in the case of 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 saint peter's the, there was a proposal even to demolish the dome gaetano chiaveri proposed to demolish the dome in 1900 the dome of saint paul's there was some cracks in 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 the in the foundations there were some cracks in the fabric, and these cracks, which have existed there for since the beginning, they were interpreted as the sign of ruin. And then for, they uh, studied the problem for 20 years. But one of the proposals 
which was taken seriously, was just to demolish the dome of Christopher Wren and to rebuild it again in reinforced concrete, which was better. And the, the thing went so far even that in the Christmas of 1924, the city, which was fed up with all the uh, discussion, etc., closed the cathedral. Closed the cathedral. It was a, a, an expedient of urgency and they closed the cathedral just to force the architects and engineers to take a decision. And then, uh, they, of course, they decided not to demolish the, the dome. But it was on, on, on the table. It was considered. It was considered. And another case is the dome of the, the French Pantheon. The dome of the French Pantheon, there were also were, uh, many proposals. No, there was a big debate, no, Rondelet, Gauthier, etc. But some of the proposals were just to demolish the dome. So, I mean, <laughs> uh, uh, Polanyi, for example, uh, uh, he, he was uh, uh, brilliant, no, because he he uh, he he made an analysis which was right and also which agreed with the with the situation of the dome. Um, Fifty years before or sixty years before in Santa Maria del Fiore, there were cracks also, and there was a debate about what doing what should we do with the cracks, and 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 they decided not to do anything. And this is written. And they even uh, produce one uh, one iron chain, one iron chain, one hundred meters long is a lot of money, and they didn't put the chain even. They fabricated the chain. So in the course, so I mean, we can learn a lot from the history of construction, and we can learn, for example, to be careful, to be respectful, to have confidence in these structures which have survived not only the pass of time but the intervention of many architects and engineers which is uh, a merit so uh, uh, okay. but i insist that the, our laboratory is history we have a lot of data another surprise in mexico when i visit with mauricio is that uh, after the after the earthquake they remove everything they don't they didn't document the collapse i mean Oh, an earthquake is a is a catastrophe, but we can learn. I mean, how, what was the how, how could you interpret what has happened if the day after the collapse they enter with a caterpillar and remove all the the ruins? All the ruin. It is impossible to know if it is out of plane or in plane or so. This kind of of uh, uh, I mean, uh, this is common sense and. But uh, but in general, uh, I think we should be confident. And, and the problem is this distrust. And this distrust is based in ignorance. Ignorance produces fear, and fear produces uh, uh, an aggressive aggressive response. In this case, against the monument. No? Yeah. I cannot imagine next time they open the cracks in the Pantheon. What would happen? They would close the, 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 the cracks with some expansive mortar. There is now a proposal in Mexico, uh, in a church with a, uh, with a church which uh, resisted the earthquake with almost no signs. So no, no, no cracks, almost nothing. So the church was there. In, in one of the pillars, there is a, 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 an stair to go to the pulpit inside the pillar, no? This is normal, no? Well, uh, some 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 engineer wants to to fill this void with expansive mortar. Could you imagine? <laughs> An explosion! 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 I mean, but, <laughs> but but I, but I mean, what is happening? What is happening? I, I mean, the, the, our duty is to 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 understand what is happening, no? I mean, it is. It is distrust. It is uh, ignorance. Uh, there is a historical uh, reason. No, I mean the, this tradition collapsed during the 20th century. The propaganda of reinforced concrete was aggressive. Mm -hmm. So concrete was the eternal material because it was monolithic, not like masonry. Masonry is bad. Masonry is cracked. 
cracks are dangerous. I mean, all these uh, messages has been on the literature since the uh, this, since the early 20th century. Mm -hmm. The thing accelerated in the second part of the 20th century because uh, the old professors and the old masons simply died. And there, there are now very few people who, who are sensible to these kind of things. And we need to, to recover uh, what is left of this. Uh, and then, not, not only because we cannot copy now uh, what they did 100 years ago, the situation is different. I mean, we, we should in some way uh, assimilate this and, and incorporate this to our modern knowledge. You know? But uh, uh, I don't know, it is in any way, in any case, it is a very, very, to me, it's a fascinating topic to, to see these ideas which are in, which are in, in the mind, no? Because if you have a preconception, a prejudice, prejudice, no? Before thinking about something, you have an idea. And, and this idea condition uh, what what you think, and, and and sometimes it is unconscious. You are not even aware that you have this idea because it is uh, uh, common knowledge. No? It is common knowledge. No? This is a crack. This is bad. No discussion. No. It is uh, everybody agrees, and we must do something. And we must. Uh, and then the intensity of the intervention depends on, on many factors. No. On the on the alarm, some 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 engineers and architects cause alarm. If you go to a building and say, "Well, this is going to collapse," well, you attract immediately the attention, no? Yes. No, because if someone after you after this man comes and say, "Well, it is not going to collapse," then he assumes all the responsibility, no? Mm -hmm. But this kind of thing, no? But but it, the same occurs in, in, in medicine, no? A physician. Okay. Any any patient exploratory surgery. No? Always exploratory surgery. No. Well. Anyway. Okay. I hope that in this laboratory you discuss these things. <laughs> Other questions? No, però volevo aggiungere um, io una cosa. Professor, if I, if I can, I have a question. Sì. Dai, Armando. Um, first of all, I would like to, to thank you, the professor Puerta, for, uh, for his lesson that I found uh, uh, very interesting uh, because uh, also I've read and uh, took a lot from his book for both my uh, bachelor and master degree thesis, and uh, I would like to attach to the question that the Professor Fardos have uh, done previously and ask if uh, there are in uh, the scientific literature some evidence uh, uh, of the change in uh, the structural behavior and uh, resistance of uh, measuring structures, uh, not only um, subjected to the earthquakes, but uh, also uh, for, for, um, for construction that had uh, been uh, some uh, uh, very seriously fire events. Thank you. Uh, um, well, I, what, I have not understood. What, what is the question? If, sì, Armando, parla meglio. Io non ho capito neanche io bene qual era la domanda finale. Oh, ok, I'm sorry. It's probably because I'm, I'm driving now. Uh, the question is that uh, um, if there are some uh, um, evidence about the change, uh, or better, the influence of geometry in the change uh, of the behavior, of the structural behavior of masonry construction, uh, when uh, uh, this construction have, uh, uh, has been subjected to some fire, some great ah. fire event. Yes, yes. Um, well, the fire may affect uh, masonry in many ways, uh, uh, depending on the fire. Uh, uh, in Notre Dame, we saw that the effect of fire was to, uh, to burn the roof and the tons of the roof fell down on the bolts. 
And, and, and the fact is that the vaults resisted, so the vaults uh, saved the cathedral. Only the part of the spire, the central part of the spire, uh, uh, perforated the vaults. And the way the, the fire may damage uh, masonry uh, depends on, on the fire. Uh, 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 well, there is one case, uh, an extreme case was the case of the La Santa Sindone in Torino, no? Uh, this great fire in 1996, and uh, I visited uh, the the Sindone maybe in 2005 or six, and and there the the, the fire was uh, extremely violent, and for many hours, and they fractured uh, many stones, and and I I don't I don't know what they did uh, in the end. I, I I know that it is now open. But uh, I think um, because the structure was made of, of, of brick um, and covered by marmor, black marmor, very good. And, the, and because of the, of the change of temperature, because uh, one problem is the firemen. No, when the firemen goes, they, then they, 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 of course, they, they, they try to stop the fire and they, they, they throw water. And there is a, an abrupt change of temperature, and and, the, and many many stones were fragmented. Even the stones which remain in place, and, and I, I guess that in the end they replace all the stones. Uh, and it is uh, it is just uh, if if the geometry, if the general geometry is not affected, then the the, the overall stability is the same. But uh, but uh, the, the the state, the actual state of the of the masonry should be should be inspected with with care, no. Um, and in, in, in some cases, pues, whole parts of the masonry should be replaced. This is another question. No? Uh, um, some people interpret the Venice chart that you cannot replace a stone with another stone. No? I, I mean, uh, um, uh, this has been done always, uh, particularly in the most exposed parts, in pinnacles and towers. They have been replacing stones. Uh, Maybe every 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 one hundred years or every every one hundred and fifty years, you must replace the pinnacles, etc. No, and there is no, I see no problem on that. No, um, and and there is a, another anecdote. Um, I was in, in in a symposium in in Lausanne, and in Lausanne the the stone is very bad. It is uh, called uh, molas, and the, the molas uh, uh, in, in 100 years almost disgregate uh, and there was a great debate about the flying buttresses no? the flying buttresses uh, were instrumented uh, like a, like a, like a, a sick man in the in the intensive care no? with all kind of apparatus trying to uh, to investigate the thrust of the flying buttresses and and they were considering to to replace the the old molas with another better stone and well it was a symposium mainly they were geologists and then i asked the engineer uh, well but this these flying buttresses are not original no no they are not original and um, and how old are they 200 years well what is the problem you substitute again the flying buttresses with a new flying buttress of the same material respecting the the, the identity of the construction, and then you will have uh, flying buttresses for 200 years. This is not bad, no? I mean, this uh, nothing is permanent. This this idea of of eternal, no? Uh, this is a fantasy, no? This is a fantasy. Nothing is permanent. Uh, the uh, buildings must be maintained, and and some stones should be replaced, and and and, and of course, the, if the maintenance is continuous, then the the, the building. Uh, uh, the masonry buildings uh, are extremely robust, and but the problem is the abandonment. No? If you abandon a building for 50 years, then it is easily that this building will become a ruin. No? It is extremely fast, no? but uh, uh, I guess that uh, uh, the, the, this is a, a very important part to distinguish what is maintenance and what is an invasive intervention. No? Uh, maintenance should be made uh, historically. Uh, Professor Heyman said that historically, uh, the period of a great uh, maintenance intervention is 100 years, 150 years. 
to, to put uh, global scaffolds and and to check all the etc. No, and this should be done and should be done. Uh, for example, now in the Cathedral of Mallorca, which I wrote a report some years ago, uh, uh, there are uh, falling uh, some uh, splits of stone because of, uh, uh, for example, they put some plaster in the 50 years ago. The only way to, to, to check that the vaults are in a good state is to put an scaffold and to inspect the vaults and to... to, to uh, to refill the joints and to inspect and maybe to replace a stone and this should be done. We, we, we needed we needed to wait until a piece of stone fall on the head of someone, no? But uh, this is usually the the, the politics is that just to wait that there is an accident and then uh, the, all the procedure is contaminated by this uh, alarm. It is in the newspapers, etc. No, the regular maintenance uh, should be. Uh, uh, the usual thing, no? I mean, so this this kind of of of, of care, no, and and not because the, the problem is that, uh, for example, in Mexico now they they have a lot of money, not for for intervention in some churches, and this this is a real danger, no? If you have a lot of money, you have the temptation to 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 fix the problem forever, no? And that, to fix the problem forever means well. To, to put a lot of uh, Kevlar or or now Mapei, no, or was or whatever the or reinforce, no, the reinforce uh, uh, the the vaults, no. How can you reinforce a vault which is 500 years old and uh, putting some some strips of of this this kind of things that are uh, popular in, in some people, no, which are expensive, uh, useless, uh, ugly. Um, Contradict the the, the 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 material and the and, and the spirit of the spirit of the construction and so uh, okay. Maria Grazia, che volevi dire tu? Maria Grazia, volevi dire qualcosa? Uh, sì, volevo solamente aggiungere, uh, riconducendomi a quello che mi aveva chiesto, se io avessi domande in merito al restauro. No, non, non, continuo a non avere domande in merito all'esposizione del professore, uh, sia per la chiarezza di quello che ci, ci sta uh, dicendo, sia per l'aspetto sempre più importante che ha messo in luce anche con le ultime risposte. Che prima di qualsiasi intervento, noi come architetti, come ingegneri, eh, come tecnici, dobbiamo capire quello che facciamo, perché è facile dire eh, quella crepa e porta un crollo, quando in molti casi, come ci ha spiegato, è solo un elemento naturale, è solo un movimento, è solo... La, la giusta composizione dei vari materiali che porta a quella, a quella quindi da questo mi ricollego a dire che forse dovremmo imparare a conoscere meglio le tecniche con cui si fanno gli eh. edifici per poi intervenire in maniera corretta e, e di rispetto rispettando quello che è l'edificio che molte volte come ci ha detto il professore, non si fa. Si interviene per intervenire e si fa sparire una scala con uh, un cemento solo perché si vuole farlo, senza nessuna motivazione vera. Quindi ringrazio il, il professore e lei per averci dato questa opportunità oggi. No, esageria. Grazie al professore. C'è qualcun altro che vuole intervenire? Volevo dire una cosa sulla Sacra Sindone, Vai, la cupola del Guarini, perché ha una storia molto simile a quella della, di, di, di Notre Dame, nel senso che eh, ci fu, mi pare nel 90, ci fu un, cadde un pezzo di marmo dall'interno e quindi andò un'impresa, chiusero la cappella, andò un'impresa che dovevano risistemare la, la cupola. 
e poi dopo diversi anni perché i lavori durarono moltissimo dopo diversi anni per un cortocircuito del cantiere si sviluppò questo incendio che fece arrivare a temperature elevatissime perché loro per salvare la sindrome sì, non ne aprirono tutti i finestroni superiori, quindi fece una specie di camino, le temperature arrivarono a livelli molto alti. Poi giustamente, come diceva Santiago, andarono con l'acqua, i pompieri, per spegnere l'incendio, e il marmo, perché la parte superiore della cupola del Guarini è meravigliosa, è una rete di archi, tutti svuotati, quindi sotto c'è la muratura in mattoni, coperta dal marmo e sopra ci stanno questi archi vuoti che creano questa cupola e sono in marmo marmo verde adesso io sono, non sono esperto di pietra però loro l'hanno trovata la vecchia cava e li hanno sostituiti perché erano tutti quanti degradati è rimasta solo la parte superiore eh, il coronamento dove c'era una cosa bellissima di, eh, un, di, le, le, degli archi radiali con una parte centrale ad anello che è rimasta quella originaria perché era impossibile sostituirla, ma anche quella abbastanza danneggiata. E la pietra si rompeva con le mani, c'erano dei pezzi di pietra che facevano vedere del vecchio, dopo il vecchio incendio e si era completamente disgregato. Quindi l'hanno cambiata e l'hanno rifatte di nuovo con laser scan, con laser, con la, con laser. Taglio, laser. taglio laser, sì, taglio laser con controllo numerico. Controllo numerico sì. Eh, non sono riusciti però a rifare esattamente quello che aveva fatto il Guarini perché c'erano degli arcotravi come quelli che ci ha mostrato Santiago no? cioè de, quindi degli architravi fatti in pezzi e loro non si, erano senza nulla erano, erano accostati uno all'altro con le colonne sopra e loro ci hanno messo delle barre perché non si fidavano pensavano che <ride> sì. l'ha confessato il direttore dei lavori che non hanno, non hanno avuto il coraggio di farli come l'aveva fatto i guarini che era un prete architetto va bene vuoi fare tu una conclusione Maurizio? no no niente voglio ringraziare Santiago e niente liberare i ragazzi che sono stati qua fino ad ora dire che il problema del, della scarsa comprensione di queste strutture è un, è un problema, è una piaga che noi abbiamo e che dovremmo cercare di risolvere, anche perché i regolamenti non ci aiutano. Addirittura negli anni Ottanta ci fu una circolare dopo il terremoto dell'Irpinia che diceva che tutte le strutture spingenti dovevano essere demolite e quindi in molti posti che non erano protetti da, dalla sovrintendenza pensarono bene di eliminare le volte perché, perché le volte spingono quando la spinta della volta è un fatto invece positivo cioè dove una, una, una costruzione fatta con una, in, un edificio fatto con le volte è molto più resistente di uno fatto con i solai quindi non, è una follia poi fortunatamente questa cosa non si è fatta più però si, ci fu un periodo nel quale furono demolite diverse di queste volte Va bene, e niente, ci vediamo quindi poi, vi ringrazio. Il prossimo intervento. Allora, ringraziamo molto il professor Huerta del suo intervento, ci ha fatto veramente una bella lezione, penso che come no, la nostra dottoranda di restauro ha potuto dire, sono, sono concetti che sono arrivati direttamente no, nella, nella testa dei nostri studenti. Quindi, molte grazie. Grazie. Buona serata a tutti. Buona serata. Ciao. Arrivederci.